Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Allison Faulkner. Allison is a branding and events expert, host of the podcast Awesome with Allison, which is a top 100 health and wellness podcast. She's a consultant for Fortune 500 companies, a writer, speaker, and self-proclaimed nonsense dancer and CEO of Allison's Brand School, where she partners with companies like Microsoft and Alaska Airlines, among others. She is also obsessed with her kids, husband, family, and friends. And the occasion for today's chat is her new book, You're Already Awesome, which I thoroughly enjoyed, and I think you will too. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Allison Faulkner to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Allison, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Doug. This is very exciting. I'm super excited to talk to you as well. We were just talking before we recorded just about like how much we had in common and just how fun we thought the conversation was going to be that I was like, man, we got, we better record because we're just missing so many nuggets. And <laughs> <laughs> I, I normally don't do this, but I gave you a forewarning on my first question I was going to ask you because I didn't want you to be offended. I was kind of explaining why I was asking the question and I think it's going to be very useful for the audience. I'm already offended, I know. so let's just <laughs> move forward. <laughs> as we've already discussed. But with that said, you've got a book out that is called You're Already Awesome. And I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. I love how you intertwined like your personal experiences with some science, with some practical tips on how to help people turn a setback into a comeback, turn a negative into a positive, pick themselves up after falling down, if you will. But there's so many like rah-rah, pep talk, self-help books that come out every single year. What do you think in your opinion, like convince the audience, like what's different about yours? I mean, I wrote it. So there's that, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, but really like it's my voice, it's my tone, it's my conversational style. And, you know, I've been in this gig, I've been in this game for a really long time. I've, I've read lots of the books and partaken of lots of the, the ideas. And I think for me, the big shift is none of it is intended to turn you into something else. None of it is intended to hustle and force. Like, I've done that. Like, Doug, like, you know, I know that you know, like, it's not a matter of will for me. It's not a matter of uh, I need to, you know, run a marathon or plan this out. Like I can force myself into doing anything. Like override my pain, override the need for sleep, you know, like good healthy habits. No, but <laughs> and so to, you know, have approached self-help progress from that perspective, which is really like a shame inducing and really like a fear and lack based, even if you're like oh, I'm not being, you know, motivated by fear and shame. It really only works when everything is working. And so this is a book for the person that's done that and is still like under their desk, not able to face the day. The person who like still can't take the covers off. The person who's like, if you tell me one more freaking thing that I need to do, I'm going to combust. I don't want any more tips. I don't want any more hacks. I don't want any, none of it, none of it. The rebellious, <laughs> angry, <laughs> or the, I just can't do it. I can't do it anymore. I can't keep forcing. I can't keep pushing. So this is really approaching feeling as awesome as you are, which is why it's called You're Already Awesome, from a place of complete and total self-compassion, from a place of you don't have to be more, do more, earn more. All of the book is set up in shifts. And the reason I chose that word shift and there's shifts to help you feel awesome now. And the reason I chose the word shift is because it's like, just like you could, like, I'm like shifting my shoulders. Like it's just a little shimmy, right? It's just a little, it's a head turn, right? It's, it's not a, I've got to like get down and go do the work. That is so great. Doug, I'm going to hire you to like tell me to go do the work. Like, But also, I didn't even need to hire <laughs> anyone because you and I both know it's like a level deeper than that. So this is like, why this book? Why now? Good question. I've been wanting to write a book for years and years, and I've been so confused why I wasn't writing one or why it, the timing wasn't right. And right now, with the world where it's at and everybody where we're at, I'm like, oh, 
My book needed to come out right now because we're all not okay. And I'm just talking to people who aren't okay, who are used to being able to get themselves to feel okay or are sick of like being like preached at. I'm just another crazy person trying to help. Just putting my two cents in, Doug. Just another person putting my two cents in. (laughs) That's a solid explanation and justification as to like, A, like why you wrote the book. And then B, like why it's different. And I appreciate your vulnerability. I appreciate your humor and all this. And I think it's a good place to dive into. You kind of talk about this in your book too. Like I think one of the other problems with a lot of these self-help books that come out isn't just that, you know, a lot of them sound the same. It's that it's easy for somebody to listen to a podcast episode like this or even read your book. And then they feel motivated. They feel inspired. But that eventually wears off. Like it wears off in a day, it might wear off in a week, a month, and then you're kind of left in the same spot. If you don't take that action, you're in the same spot that you were before you listened to that podcast or read the book. So like, what is your advice or or how have you been able to take a book that you read or a podcast episode that you listened to and, and convert that motivation into sustained action, discipline, and change? I think that's a really good question. And I think I'm going to be so fun. Like, let's even just look at the question of how, (laughs) let's look at the question of like, how have you been able to take this principle and then get actionable results? Right? That's the question. So therefore the question is a completely achievement result oriented question, which isn't in and of itself bad or wrong. I'm not, you know, shaming your question, Doug, but right, like right there is the language, like right there. And that's, that's what I was so good at. Oh, I'm so good at it. I am so good at learning it, applying it, and then just beating myself into doing it. So for me, (laughs) my book and my approach is it's a conversation you've probably heard this before, but like the best teachers, they're not telling us things we don't already know. They're bringing things back that like we remember, like like that feels true. Like, Ooh, that, that feels true. So I approached this book and writing this from a place of there is a change, an awareness, an observation, a compassionate place to go to within yourself. And when you go to that place, That ignites a true emotional change. And then you don't have to do anything. So I talk a lot about being in flow and working in flow. And just this morning, I was telling you, I was beating the crap out of myself because I'm quote unquote training for a marathon after like literally being in bed for like a year and a half, getting back into shape. My version of getting back into shape is training for a marathon (laughs) because I like to take it nice and slow, you know? And... I was journaling, which is something I know like you're a huge supporter of because it it helps with that self-awareness. I was journaling and I realized I was the spiral. We all know our spirals, right? They can start a million different places. But like the thing about a spiral is like all roads lead to Rome, like all spirals kind of come down to the same point, right? And so what I have realized actually works for me which is why I wrote my book this way and formatted it this way is being able to like step back, notice, listening to other people's stories. I mean, there's a reason why stories have been passed throughout all of history and time. So there's a lot of storytelling, a lot of my personal story. And then really the action piece is that emotional connection and being able to have that emotional connection to realize, oh, my spiral is leading me to this point. And so this morning, to put that into application, this morning with the journaling and the self-awareness, I stopped and I was like, I don't feel like I can do a book tour and put this book out and my pants not fit. They don't get to be, they don't get to be true. It doesn't get to be true. I don't get to be, you know, not in good physical shape that I consider good physical shape and be successful. And Damn it, if that isn't just the same thing that it is my whole life, right? Like (laughs) this one sneaky landing point. And so to go into the action place, what I'm really proposing is a shift in complete mindset where the action flows from this place of effortlessness rather than force. And so 
the action that becomes then the action rather than, okay, I got to get a better running program. I better find a different fitness class. I was literally had my phone out looking up different fitness classes. And I realized I was trying to attack the problem from this place of force and what I want the result to be rather than what I want the feeling to be, which is flow and peace and joy. And it was funny because I had ripped out some pages from my book <laughs> for <laughs> for reasons, <laughs> for photo shoot reasons. You got angry or something? You got angry. Yeah, I was, don't, don't lie. <laughs> I was so on stupid book. Stop telling me what I need to do. <laughs> no. Um, and it was so funny because there was this page, a page from my own stupid book, a page from my book <laughs> on the floor. And it says, We are not defined by our pain or mistakes. Sometimes it hurts to believe that joy is available to you. It doesn't just feel like joy is impossible. It doesn't just feel like joy will never come. The actual act of keeping the faith is physically painful. In this place, no matter how many times I sing along with Wilson Phillips, it's hard to believe I can hold on for one more day. It feels like an invitation to torture. And I was like, oh, that's how I feel. Like, that's, that's how I feel. And so as I kept reading it in my own book, inviting me back to this place of not what's the action that I got to take, what's the feeling that I want to cultivate? Because I know from my experience that that feeling is going to, the action is going to like spring from it, from this place of joy and ease. Because I've done it the other way too. You get results. It definitely answered my question. And and I, I agree with you. What I was, I guess, getting at is so many people, they'll listen to an episode like this or they'll read a book and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm motivated. I'm inspired. I'm going to do the thing without really like laying any kind of foundation as to why they're doing the thing or how they're going to apply it or what are some like small steps they can take to help get them there. And they they have these, these crazy ideas of how they're going to accomplish this thing. And then like something comes up, something becomes challenging. Or maybe they realize like it wasn't really what was meant for them. Or like it's just – it's not in the cards right now. Like all these things come up and if they had done the work at the beginning to like listen to a podcast like this or a, read a personal development book or a self-help book and then really like take some time to digest it and say, okay, like how does like this apply to me? Like what are a few small nuggets that I can take and apply? Not try to apply the whole book. But take like a thing or two and just start there because I think what happens too, like the other side of that is somebody will – they'll read a book and then they'll all of a sudden just commit to healing for the next 15 years and they don't take any action. They just are continuously like reading book after book or just focusing on themselves that they just get – that becomes like an addiction, right? And then the real healing I think happens – when you start to take the chances again, you start to have faith and you start to apply like some of the things that you've worked on. So I think you said it in a, in a beautiful way. I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think this is a good a good time to kind of go into the book a little bit. Do you talk about these shifts? You, you, there's 12 shifts in the book. Like what was the hardest one for you personally to make? And if you could just explain like where you were at at the beginning before you made this shift – and then how that shift that you made like was super transformational in your life. Yeah, I think all of them were hard. There's <laughs> they're all still hard because like I learn it and I'm so cute and I teach it and I put it into application and it works. That's like step 1. And then step 2 is I put it into application, I'm not getting the results I want. Things aren't going the way I want how do I keep putting it in application, right? Like, how do I keep believing in the shift, even when it's not in that moment, immediately solving whatever I've deemed the problem is. The one that came to mind first was feeling my feelings sets me free. And I just would have, nobody would ever say, Allison, you're not feeling your feelings. I mean, look at me, how many feelings have I had in this one conversation, right? Like, (laughs) I'm very expressive. (laughs) Um, I'm very animated. And it's very sincere. I I feel, I feel, right? Feel. But I would say in the last couple years, so for context, I finished writing the book at the end of 2020. And then truly, like after I finished writing it, my body shut down. 
So my nervous system, I believe my whole life has been really dysregulated. And without like going into a whole thing, like bladder, organs, all these things just like literally like stopped working. And there weren't really any solutions. And when I say there weren't really any solutions, I mean, there were no solutions. Like the urologist sends you to the gynecologist, sends you to the practitioner, sends you to the surgeon that sends you back to the other, right? Like nobody knows what to do with you. And I think a lot of people who are in chronic cycles get that, that a lot of people don't know, you know, quite, oh, maybe try this. And they just want to throw pills and pills and pills and pills and pills wait this out, try this. And I'm, I'm for all the solutions. I'm for traditional medicine and med- shamans, right? Like I'm for everything. I believe it takes the village of tools to, to heal. And so non-traditional and traditional modalities alike, the only way that my body started to heal was from feeling my stupid feelings. And what it required me to do was to feel feelings that I didn't know I had. So how do you feel feelings you don't know you have? Right? Yeah, how do you do that? Uh, Yeah, right? It's the worst, Doug. It's the worst. And (laughs) uh, (laughs) it it sucks. (laughs) And I think that a lot of us are in this scenario because the way that, like the catalyst for it, so pain is the catalyst a lot of times, right? I'm going to feel these feelings because there's this uncomfortable pain that no matter what drugs I take or what I do, it doesn't go away, right? So there's pain. And I got to a place where like I was in so much physical pain, I would do anything, anything. And it turns out that anything was allowing a lot of like deep, dark feelings to come out. Now, it wasn't just that. But it was, you know, relearning how to regulate my nervous system. I'd been operating in fight or flight adrenaline for over 30 years. So, you know, (laughs) takes a while to re-regulate that. And I share this because 2020 was that collective pain point for a lot of people where we had to sit in discomfort and not keep doing and numbing and achieving and right? Like going, going, going. And then the pain came up. And I feel like a lot of us are in this situation where like, but how do I feel my feelings? Okay, like they're there. And the thing about feelings is watch little kids. That's how you feel them is you accept them. And you and I were both sharing, we have like three-step processes. You have AAA and I have TAP, tune in, accept, pick your focus. But it's that acceptance is so much a part of feeling your feelings. And so that shift, I wrote it and I wrote it from like one place and then I had to freaking live it. I had to like live it on a level I didn't even know was possible. (laughs) Thanks for sharing that and for, for again, like being vulnerable about it. And I think that is definitely like one of the shifts in your book that is the hardest for so many people is not just like having the self-awareness or developing the self-awareness to know like what it is they're going through or why they are feeling a certain way. But it's also like sharing their feelings in a way to like transform them into personal growth, into acceptance, into self-compassion. Adversity advantage. There we go, right? Adversity advantage. I know. It's so, you're perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And that becomes a challenge for so many people. And I'm I'm really glad that you highlighted that. One of the other ones that I think is very difficult for people is this idea that you are limitless. And when you describe it, it's not limitless in like, I don't think in an unhealthy way. I just think when you describe being limitless and for people to remember that, a lot of times when the people who need to hear that in many cases are, they're at a point in their life where they're feeling like crap. And when they hear that they're so low and they have such low self-esteem that there's almost this big level of cognitive dissonance that exists. That's like, like limitless. Like I'm not even making my mortgage payment. Like my kids won't talk to me right now. Like I have this addiction. So talk about a time in your life where you felt like super low, like what was going on and what would be a few steps that you would have taken in that moment, knowing what you know now to move yourself forward and have more, self-confidence and belief in yourself that you could be limitless. 
Thank you. I love that you brought that one up. So the shift is my true self is limitless. And I say this in the book. And so for people listening, the first thing I say is just listen to how your body emotions, your mind, like what's your physical and mental reaction to that idea? My true self is limitless. And just like you perfectly said, we're going to look at our set of circumstances. And when we're feeling on top of our game, we just hit our gains, our goals, our bank account is like four stars. We're going to be like, yeah. Yeah, my true self is limitless. Yes, yes, right? And so I <laughs> I don't mean to keep being like, it's been rough, Doug. But I'm like, right now, I don't feel limitless right now. Like right this friggin' second, I've got this freaking book coming out where I'm like cheerleader of the century on the cover. And I'm like, you're already awesome. And I've been not working, not able to work for almost two years. So people are like, it's great. You took a break. I'm like, I didn't take a break. I got taken out. Like my, like I shut down. I was not okay. And this is the place that I am launching my dream come true. The whole reason I started anything. And so it, it comes down to the core of the book is called You're Already Awesome. And in the very beginning, I define what is awesome. And I don't mean this like rah-rah feeling of feeling positive and enthusiastic all the time. I mean your inherent wholeness, your inherent divinity, your worth that is non-negotiable cannot be pulled from you no matter who you've hurt, what mistakes you've made, how many people are mad at you, like how much disgust you look back on your past actions with. Your worth is still non-negotiable. Your awesomeness is still non-negotiable. And so I think this concept of your true self is limitless, for me, so much of that has been about embracing the shadow. And that's in Jungian psychoanalysis, right? This idea of your shadow self, where it's like, I am dark and I am light and it is part of the whole. So right now, from this place of I'm qualified to sell a book, I've never felt less qualified to sell a book. (laughs) Like, I've never felt. (laughs) And I was actually listening to one of your recent episodes with Steve. I don't remember his last name. Steve Magnus. I loved it. And he talked about that humble confidence. And this is what I'm talking, like, this idea of humble confidence where it's like, yeah, man, I, like, I was a bit of a monster. That sucks. But I forgive myself and love myself anyway. I apologized. They didn't accept my apology. That, ugh, I hate that. It makes me so mad. I want to force my apology down their throat. That's how I feel right now. I want to force my apology down their throat. But I don't actually, because I believe in in agency and choice. And I choose to believe myself as limitless from this point, even if they don't believe it. I choose to believe I'm limitless from this point, even if my bank account doesn't show it. I choose to believe I'm limitless right now, even if my body, my relationships, everything that I use as a physical marker of my worth isn't showing it. Why? Why? Because I am non-negotiable in my worth. I am non-negotiable in my value as a human. I love it. Thank you. (laughs) I get into a little bit of a preacher vibe sometimes. (laughs) <laughs> At the end of the day, I think there is two choices when you're faced with adversity. And I talk about this often. It's that you can look at it and say that this is going to crush me for the rest of my life. And it's going to limit me from finding meaning. It's going to limit me from finding love. It's going to limit me from finding purpose, like all these things. Like You can look at it that way. Or you can look at it and say, I acknowledge that what I'm going through right now is hard. It sucks. It's tough. I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. And with that said, I believe that I have gotten through every other hard moment in my life up until this point. I'm still like walking. I'm still breathing. I'm still here. Like I am not going to let this moment define me. I'm going to let this moment make me. And I'm going to use this moment to my advantage. And it sounds 
Pollyanna maybe to some people, but I think that's the only option you have because if you think you're going to be limited by the situation, you're never going to have success, you're probably never going to have success because your behaviors and your actions are going to reflect what your your mind is telling you, right? That's just what happens. But if you can start to embrace like this limitless mindset, like you said, I think it at least keeps you in the game and gives you a shot to continue to move forward. And what you just described is something that like a lot of people struggle with, Allison, where they have success, then they fall, they have success, they fall, they have a lot of success, they fall. And then it's just like this mountain that they climb. And then all of a sudden, sometimes they're like near the top of the mountain and they have this massive fall. And they're like, shoot, like, what do I do? I've come so far. I've had so much success. So how did you, like at the end of 2020, you talked about how your body just shut down. You just written in this this book essentially about picking yourself back up after you've fallen. And here you are, like literally like fall, you fell off the mountain pretty much, you know, I guess in based on what you're describing me. I did. It was so bad, Doug. It was terrible. It was bad. And what was the day-to-day like early on in those moments? Like how were you feeling? Where was your self-esteem? Where was your self-confidence? And then like what were a few things other than – like the limitless mindset you talked about, what were a few things that that really helped you kind of get back up on your feet and start to climb up that mountain again? You're so good at this. I really like how this is going. Like, you're like, this is great. I love, like, it's such like a cohesive, like, I appreciate it. So, because that's really what it was, that mountain. And it was like, because you brought up earlier, and I talk about it in my book, in 2017, when I thought I was at the top of the mountain, I got hit by a car when I was running. And I learned so much from that. And I was like, man, like I got hit by a car. Like I literally like a car hit me dead on, like broken ribs, cracked vertebrae, taken out. And so then I'm like, oh, look at me, all my tools. I'm using them to get back up to the top of the mountain. And then 2020 hit and the business starts to crumble I had decided I was going to do all of my income on keynote speaking. And so I had all these (laughs) keynotes scheduled and then they all got canceled right in that point when I was like, you know what? I've been doing this long enough. I think this is a good time to quit. I'm probably just, you know, going to go do something else. Just going to go ahead and quit being me. Be completely not like myself. (laughs) That's when I got the book deal. And so I, I was able to get myself to this really beautiful place to write the book. It's like that big fall happened. And I'd say early on, one of the things that I was coming out of this really beautiful, guided, connected place having written the book. So completely reliant on guidance, spirit, flow, the universe, like just this compassionate guidance. So it was you know, really, really good to be in that very rough physical place where my body's starting to shut down. There's this pain, you know, hospitalization, nobody knows what's going on. And I just got this really, really, really distinct knowing that it wasn't going to always be like that. And that pulled me through for about six months. And each month that it kept being as bad as it was before, if not worse, I was super mad at God. I was like so mad. And so regardless of feelings about God, like people love when I'm just like, I am just like swearing. I'm like, you're a liar. You suck. This, you lied. You said it wouldn't always be like this. You said it would get better. And it just is getting worse and worse and worse. And then I got like even more depressed. (laughs) And then And I talk about this in the book and it was something I was able to like beef up after all of this experience in the book, a tool. And to your earlier question too, this tool came to mind and this would be the one takeaway. If there was one takeaway from this whole conversation, nobody even has to buy the book is to consider the source. So that source, meaning that narrative, that narrative, that voice in your head to consider the source of it. Is it coming from love or is it coming from fear? And that's what I had to start doing. And I mean, I lived hour by hour, minute by minute in that place. And this really beautiful, compassionate voice began to emerge. And this morning when I was journaling and I was like, I got to find a new fitness class. I got to be, you know, I got to wake up early to get my workouts in. That's the problem. I'm not waking up early enough, right? 
And I just said, you know what? Screw all of that. I want to get back to the compassionate voice. How do I get back to the compassionate voice? And one of the main tools for me to getting back to that compassionate inner narrative where the action rises from flow and inspiration is to, are you going to believe the voice that tells you that if your bank account and your pants aren't a certain way that you don't get to talk about your book, you don't, you don't get to go into the world and try to make a difference? Like, that, am I going to listen to that voice? Or am I going to listen to the source of my true self is limitless? Which one makes me go out and which one makes me collapse in? And I really re- realized over the last couple of weeks, I've been listening to the voices that cause me to collapse in and that's okay. I needed to collapse. I needed to go collapse and feel my freaking feelings and be so freaking scared to put this out there. I'm terrified. I'm, of course I'm terrified. Of course, like, duh. But fighting that and being like, oh, I'm terrified, so I shouldn't get to do it. Oh, I'm terrified, so I'm going to, you know, eat and eat and eat and numb it out. Does that still mean I don't get to do it? No, I'm terrified. And I like white bread with peanut butter when I'm terrified. Like, this is, this is, this is where we're at, right? And so consider this source where I'm like, first off, let's just like think about, okay, so it really sounds like I'm really worried about how I look. And not just like how I physically look, but like what other people are going to think about me because I'm putting this big thing out there and I've been away for a couple years and it was so nice. Doug, it was so nice. I've been putting content out on a basically daily basis for over 15 years. Do you know how good it was to tell people nothing? It was the best. I loved it. (laughs) Right? It really was. At the end of the day, it's not my truth. It's not even my personality. You met me for half an hour. You know it's not my person. <laughs> like, it was me taking my, my words away, taking myself away because I didn't feel safe. And so to get back to putting into practice, I believe we teach and write what we need. And I'm sure like with your books, you've written three, that experience of like you write it and then you're like, oh, I needed to hear that. Okay. Oh, interesting. I think I wrote this book for me. Okay, right? <laughs> and and that's just like the decision. I was like, how am I going to, you know, get on this podcast with Doug and and feel confident in my message and and feel worthy? And it really just came it comes down to it's like, yeah, I don't feel worthy all the time. I don't feel confident all the time. But what voice, what source am I listening to? Am I listening to a voice that's saying, in order to be worthy, I have to feel that way all the time? Like, that doesn't even make sense, right? Like, that's crazy talk. And so that would be the takeaway is just start to listen to the voice and ask yourself, because universe, love, God, compassion, forgiveness, they do not speak in shame. They do not speak in shame. They do not speak in shame. And I go back to, we were talking about, I love the 12 steps so much and the serenity prayer. And also just like, I'm back to like, okay, I'm going to surrender one day at a time. I got to get back to surrendering one day at a time. I can only do this whole freaking thing one day at a time. And listening to the voice and considering the source one hour at a time, one minute at a time, one thought at a time. That's all I can do. Like step by step, day by day, um, choosing which voice in your head you're going to believe and then taking action based off that. I mean, I think that is the thing, right? I think that what separates people from making it and not making it is the people who make it, I believe, like are able to develop that self-awareness, listen to the thoughts and their voices in their head, know what's true, know what's not, and then be so like meticulous and hyper-focused to the best of their ability at like becoming a better version of themselves like that day and then taking it to the next day. Because what I think what the other side of the people who don't make it is they future trip and they'll say things like, well, what's the point of trying? I already know that I'm going to fail in a month or what's the point of trying? Like how, if I can't even stay on my fitness path, like one day, how am I going to stay on it for three months or whatever the case, like fill in the blank. Like you see where I'm going with this when people are continue to future trip and almost like rationalize their excuses in a way and talk themselves out of changing their lives because in many cases, like it's easy to, to do that, to talk yourself out of it. And 
because the change is hard. And with that said, I think one of the hardest changes for people to make is like transcending. I, I don't know if that's the right word, but you know, almost like transcending the relationship with validation. Woo yes. We live in a world where it's easy to get external validation, whether it's through social media, whether it's through making money, whether it's through vanity, whether it's, you know, just through even like, like your job or relationships, whatever it is. And I think valid, some external validation obviously is healthy. I think recognition is important. I think sometimes achievement and goals, like those things like drive us to become better as humans. But I think if you're doing it to fill a void inside, you set yourself up for failure because that cup becomes empty very quick, very quickly. And I think it's easy for some people to say, I'm going to stop like living for the external. I'm going to live for the internal. But when push comes to shove, like it's a really hard thing to do for so many people. Like in your own experience, because you've made this, you've kind of made this part of your book, like how were you able to change your relationship with validation and start to have a healthier relationship with it? Wait, tell me, say your question one more time. <laughs> I was asking you, like, how did you transform your relationship with, with validation? Oh, see, this is so funny. So one thing I've noticed is when I'm about to, and you can leave all this in, when I'm about to share something that I think is like really pertinent, like I'll forget it. Like, like it feels like a pivotal point in a conversation with somebody and it will just, it will just slip. And I think it's really interesting, like it could be very mystical, I'm very mystical, but it could be for a number of reasons where it's like, I do, I believe very much, do you like um, Stephen Pressfield's The the War of Art? I haven't read it, but I know who he is. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. So it's just all about resistance. And basically the takeaway, it's really short. The takeaway is like, if you're doing anything worthwhile, resistance comes up, Right. And so I think lots of times, even with like pivotal conversations, like this resistance will come up where you're like, wait, what was I going to say? Anyway, so this external internal validation, I mean, this is like, this is it. Like, this is it for me. I basically thought that if other people thought I was a good person, I was good. It's easy. Of course. Of course, if other, if everybody around me is telling me that I'm doing good, I'm good. And so like right there, like, it no longer just becomes like this idea of validation. It becomes an idea of life or death. And like you were saying, like certain validation is, is good and necessary. Well, of course, because we're a tribal species, we're interconnected. Like we need each other to survive, not just to survive, but to thrive. Human connection and relationships are part of our fundamental core system of needs, right? So this idea like validation, which comes from like external sources, will yeah, it's inherently tied to us. But when it's tied to our worth, our value, rather than like our core need to connect, I'm thinking of like the solar plexus chakra, which is like your center chakra, like around your belly button, where that has a lot, it's the color yellow, it has a lot to do with connection and feeling connected. And so people will say, if you're feeling out of balance, you know, you got to think about your solar plexus chakra and your solar plexus chakra is so much about how you connect with yourself and with other people. So you're feeling disconnected. So I even say that to go one step deeper where it's like this form of validation. It's not just like, oh, I want to know that I'm doing a good job. It's like, I want to feel safe and like I get to survive and continue living, right? Like I need this on like a core human level. And so my journey with that has been all over the place where I'm like, okay, external validation, other people, like I didn't consciously think I thought this, of course, right? But like other people reflecting back to me that I'm good and I'm doing a good job means I'm doing good. Okay, that's making me miserable, trying to please people as my business grew, as my events grew. Like I couldn't scale that. I couldn't survive. I could do it when my circle of people was smaller, but as my circle of influence and people got bigger and bigger, I couldn't do it. So then I was like, oh, I'm not going to listen to any feedback. Well, then I felt really cut off and isolated. And it was like there weren't a lot of the, the good connection rewards. And so at the end of the day, <laughs> I think there's connection, there's validation, and then there's worth. And maybe if we chunk them into three different categories, that might be helpful to start wrapping our brain around it. Because I think we subconsciously, 
and unconsciously lump them all together. So there's validation. Maybe I'm meaning validation like confidence or faith in myself. Does that have to come externally? No, it doesn't. Maybe I'm talking about validation connection. I know that people love me. Okay, that might require like having some open heartfelt relationships and and conversations. And then there's validation from, let's go back to that idea of my true self is, is limitless, where I'm like, it's your value and your worth validation telling you you're worthy, you're worth something. That doesn't work either. That's just going to lead us down a path of, of misery. And so it's been really, you know, convoluted, learn, fail, try this out, try that out. And that's why I really like my book. <laughs> because at the, at the end of the day, to come back to, I'm already awesome. I'm already whole. How do I want to connect with the world? What do I want to put into the world? How do I want to feel as I move through the world? And one of the exercises that I use in my book all of the time, when something feels too good to be true for me, where I'm like, I get to believe my true self is limitless. Oh, that's going to make me selfish. That's going to make me complacent. That's going to make me think I'm better than other people. Okay, maybe. But if everyone around me believed that they were also limitless, how would that make the world a better place? And I can only see that making the world a wonderful place because that source of limitless isn't from narcissism, isn't from the ego, because that's not the true source. That's not the source that is expanding and soul affirming and journey affirming. And so my relationship with it is like any other relationship. It's a day-to-day living, breathing relationship that I have to check on, I have to check in with. And like just earlier today, I was like, oh, it seems to really matter to me how I look right now to other people, which is why I'm feeling bad. (laughs) And I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go, I'm going to talk to Doug. And I'm just going to make a great connection with somebody that I really respect and think is doing really important work. And if I have something of value to share, that's it. That's it. That's all she's doing. <laughs> right? <laughs> I appreciate the kind words and, and again, your, your openness and, and what you shared. And it, it is a journey, like this relationship with validation. It's like a dance where sometimes it's good to have this external validation like and sometimes it's it's bad and sometimes we need to pump ourselves up and help us feel stronger about who we are based on how we feel on the inside and sometimes like we don't like we already have that and we're speaking from a place and acting from a place of inspiration last question i have kind of is an extension of what we just talked about you got the book that's going to be out by the time this episode releases and Obviously, you want the book to sell. I mean, that's the goal of writing a book. You want people to read the book. Like, it's not like you're sitting here saying, Yeah, like, I'm not going to, if the book does amazing, I'm going to feel like crap about myself. Right. But there is this chance that the book either does really well or the book doesn't. So, how are you feeling right now with yourself and your relationship with validation? Like, how are you prepping yourself to handle like what happens with the book? Right? Yeah. What am I doing? You know, I think what I was, <laughs> what am I even doing? I think what I was doing for the last couple of weeks, if I'm super honest with myself, was like hiding. I was like, just see you later, suckers. I wrote it. Do what you want. It will sell. It won't sell. I'm going to moonwalk out of here, you know? And that was my coping mechanism for a couple of weeks leading up to, <laughs> to the launch. But luckily, When you're coming at something from your absolute rock bottom, there's nowhere to go but up. (laughs) So I already won. Like, I already won. When I got the book contract, when I wanted to quit, I had a little little shimmy, a little heart-to-heart with God where I was like, I will write this damn book. I will write the freaking book. Fine. But I am not doing it the way I've done everything else which is with so much debilitating anxiety that I'm just fighting my way through the whole time, just white knuckling it. Now, what it took for me to get here, I made a bargain. I didn't know what the cost was going to (laughs) be. My body then shut down (laughs) and I had to like reassess my whole sense of reality. (laughs) But 
how I'm preparing myself for it is just like I said, like I, you know, preparing myself for this interview today is like, what's it all about? Yeah, it would be so cool if this book is a huge bestseller. I think it's really good. I think it's really fun and kind and compassionate. So that's a win already that I feel so proud of it before anybody else has read it, before anybody else tells me what to think about it. I know what I think about it. So that's a huge win for me. And the other win for me is I've, I've got it on a post-it note here right by me is I wrote the book to the one. So writing the book to the critics or the people who are going to tear me down or the people who are going to say, you know, we already heard this or you're a privileged white girl. We don't need another book from you. That's sure. Let's say that's all true, right? I'm not writing to them. I'm writing to the person that I've been so many times which is the person at their breaking point who just needs a shift. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me something hard. Just give me a new perspective. Just give me something to pull my thoughts outside of this spiral and into something more affirming. And so the way that I keep preparing myself to be okay with whatever the result is, is one, it's none of my business. It's truly none of my business. I've done enough things. I've sold enough programs. I've done enough events where I'm like me forcing it or thinking I'm going to hit some sales goal based on like thinking I control the universe is just a cute little illusion, right? All I can do is take the next right action. And for me, the next right action is going to arise when I focus on the one-on-one. The one. I wrote it to the one. I'm having a conversation with Doug. If one person from the podcast listens and hears, awesome. And I think in our social media numbers obsessed just phase we're all going through, which is let's just call it a, a world phase, we forget like how how meaningful and impactful the one to one is. And so if I go to Baltimore or if I go to a book city and I do a book event and five people show up when I'm used to 500 people showing up, like, hot damn, what an honor. Like, really, what an honor to have five people who maybe feel a little better than they did before. Now, it's one thing to say it and sound all altruistic when I say it, and then I can be at home beating myself up about it. But (laughs) how I get myself out of it is to just like get over myself, like get over it. Five people. That's incredible. Was it worth getting out of bed for five people? Absolutely. And so that's my game plan, Doug. Any suggestions? (laughs) I think you nailed it, right? I think your, (laughs) your honesty and your openness and your realness is going to, to relate to a lot of people. And I wanted to thank you for coming on here and just everything that you shared. And And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to check out Allison's book. I'm going to link it here in the show notes. You're already awesome. It's out now. For those also listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that that Allison said about like when she had this moment at the end of 2020 when her world came crashing down before her and how she picked herself back up out of that. Maybe it was something that she said as to why her book is different or something she just said about how she's preparing for the launch or something that she said about her relationship with feeling her feelings or feeling that she's limitless, whatever it was, make sure to tag Allison and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and we'll see you next time.